thank you very much everyone for staying here until the end of the conference. Uh, my name is Germán Martínez from the University of Michigan, although I will be moving to the Lunar and Planetary Institute in Houston in only one week. So last week with uh, you meet, uh, oh, I'll keep the affiliation anyway. Um, so first of all, I want to thank uh, the conveners for inviting me to give this talk. I also want to thank my uh, collaborators, Eric Fisher and Nilton Breno, uh, for, uh, I want to acknowledge their contribution to this work. I also want to thank uh, NASA for the funding and the Mars Science Laboratory and the Mars 20 and 20 mission also for the funding. And as you can see today, I'll be talking about brine formation on Mars and uh, in the icy walls through lab experiments and instrument development. Um, okay, so why are brands that important? You know all. Um, so, um, pretty much life requires three main ingredients uh, to evolve. We need water, we need a source of energy, and uh, we need nutrients and raw materials. So we know that on Earth, uh, a diverse array of uh, microorganisms uh, thrives in, in brines. And uh, as, for as for instance, we have brine habitats found in, in, in Antarctica's blood falls. There was a previous talk on, on this. We also have a bacterial brine pool that were found on a deep sea mud volcano in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, so uh, could brines form on Mars and in the icy walls? And if brines form in these uh, walls, could microorganisms thrive in such brines? So that's the topic of my, of my talk today. Uh, so let's uh, start by reviewing the evidence for uh, the evidence of brine on Mars. So currently there are four uh, wet-like surface features that have been hypothesized to contain brine on, on current Mars, okay? Uh, oops, sorry. Here. Uh, so um, on low and mid latitudes, we have the gullies, uh, we have the aerosol, we have slope streaks. Then at northern latitudes, we have the CO2 jets. And in addition to these uh, surface features, uh, we also have these spheroids that were found on the struts of the Phoenix lander and that were hypothesized to be brine that grew by the liquescence. Of course, for every of these uh, features, uh, not only wet mechanisms have been proposed for their formation and evolution, also dry mechanisms. And indeed, for some of these guys, the dry mechanism is the most widely accepted mechanism, but that is a, you know, like that's a different topic uh, for a different presentation. Um, so, okay, so how would brine form on Mars? Um, two mechanisms have been suggested. So uh, formation by salts absorbing atmospheric water vapor in a process called deliquescence, and then the typical process, which is uh, formation by salts mel melting water ice. Uh, so here, I want to illustrate the process of deliquescence. So here, I'm showing the stability diagram uh, for sodium, magnesium, and calcium perchlorate. These are, these are very relevant salts for Mars because they are widespread on the planet and they have very low geotectic uh, values. Uh, so here I'm showing on the y-axis the temperature and the relative humidity on the x-axis. And then basically, like in deliquescence, uh, brine forms when the relative humidity exceeds a certain threshold called deliquescent relative humidity. So let's imagine that we start here with a crystalline uh, calcium perchlorate, for instance. That's what we would have here. So if we increase uh, the relative humidity, when we cross that threshold, we would, uh, a, a brine would form. And that's, again, the deliquescent relative humidity for these, for these results. Obviously, in melting formation, the only thing we need is that the temperature is above the eutectic value of the salt in contact with the, with the water ice. So... Okay, now that we understand the mechanisms for, uh, for brine formation on Mars, we took the next step and we designed our Michigan Mars Environmental Chamber. Uh, this was funded uh, with, uh, with, with funding from the Exobiology uh, Program and, and ENDA Program. Uh, so in this chamber, we use Raman spectroscopy and a camera to detect brine formation. And we are quite happy with the performance of the chamber. We think that it has great capabilities that can simulate uh, uh, full, uh, the full environmental, the full range of environmental conditions found on Mars. So we can simulate relative humidity, temperature, and pressures that have been measured in situ on Mars. I'll be showing that. 
And as an example of the performance of our chamber, every relative humidity sensor that has flown to Mars has been recalibrated in our chamber at some point. Uh, the one at the Phoenix, MSL, and also Mars 20 and 20 and ExoMars. So, okay, here I am showing experimental results uh, for deliquescence. So remember, just like, like uh, crystalline salt and atmospheric water vapor, no ice involved. And um, so what we did here was to expose a piece of uh, calcium perchlorate to environmental conditions uh, at a relative humidity of 100% and temperature of 223 Kelvin. So again, our sample was a piece of perchlorate salt exposed to saturated conditions. And obviously we were expecting deliquescence because these are conditions favorable for that. But uh, what we found was that, uh, so here in the top figure, I'm showing the Raman spectra um, uh, for, for the sample at different times during the experiment. So in, in minute zero and then like, like um, three hours and a half later, again, at these constant conditions. And what we can see is that based on the Raman spectra, uh, brine did not form. So basically there, were, there wasn't any variation in the spectra except for this shoulder here which is indicative of uh, a change in the hydration state. We can see that better uh, in, the, in the bottom figure here. I'm showing the Gaussian decomposition of the red curve. So we took the Raman spectra at the end of the experiment. We took the Gaussian decomposition. And what we see is that uh, these spectral peaks are indicative of the presence of perchloric salt. But none of those peaks are telling us that liquid brine form. And same thing with the images. So this is important because here what we found was that kinetics matter. It's not enough with conditions to be favorable, but uh, maybe it's a matter of time exposed to those conditions. I'll, I'll get into more details later. Um, okay, <clears throat> so now uh, regarding ice melting, so previous experiment was for deliquescence. Now let's move to the other mechanism. Let's uh, move to ice melting. So what we did here was to put a piece of perchlorate salt on top of water ice. So we had perchlorate, uh, perchlorate salt and water ice in contact. And then we simulated the full diurnal cycle uh, at the, uh, with conditions from the Phoenix landing site. So this is shown here uh, in the figure on the left. And what we did was to simulate here in red the temperature inside the chamber, which is again like uh, simulating ground temperatures at the Phoenix landing site. And we also simulated the frost point, or, or equivalently, the relative humidity inside the chamber. And uh, what we found is that pretty much a couple of minutes after the temperature in the chamber exceeded the eutectic temperature of calcium perchlorate, and that happened between B and C, around there. So uh, the eutectic temperature of calcium perchlorate is 199 Kelvin. So again, we did this in real time. We were sitting there for, for 24 hours, and or more Eric Fisher than me. But uh, the thing is that right after, at, that was like at 4 a.m., I think, Phoenix uh, local time, as soon as we crossed the eutectic value, uh, the composition or Gaussian decomposition of the Raman spectra told us about the presence of liquid water. And that is also clearly visible from, from these images. Uh, I didn't want to go with the Gaussian decomposition, but uh, again, like, uh, if you decompose like, the, the spectra uh, at all these times, basically, like uh, from B to E, you clearly see peaks corresponding to, to water, uh, to brine formation. So um, our first set of conclusions here is that, okay, it is, it's obvious conclusions, but it's uh, still important. It is of paramount importance to know the actual relative humidity and temperature environment on Mars, like the specific and contemporaneous or simultaneous values of temperature and relative humidity are, are, are needed. We need to know that. And also, we need to understand kinetics, because again, it, it's, it's a necessary condition that conditions are favorable, but not sufficient. Um, and that's, that this is why, again, like when we went with the liquescence, uh, or sorry, when we went with ice melting, that was like a for sure process in a couple of minutes, but not with uh, the liquescence. So, uh, okay, the actual um, relative humidity and temperature environment is important to know, so that was our next step. Uh, because I forgot to mention that, but in the previous experiment, we were using simulated data of relative humidity and ground temperature, because those values had not been measured or were not available on Mars. So the next thing that we did was to try to get the most realistic relative humidity and temperature values. 
So as you know, the relative humidity has only been measured by the Phoenix mission in 2008 and now by the Mars Science, uh, by the Curiosity rover, by the MSL. These are the only two sensors. Uh, the thing is that uh, the, the, the Phoenix TCP, the, 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 the relative humidity sensor on board the Phoenix, um, the original calibration only partially overlapped the conditions that were later found uh, at the Phoenix landing site. So in 2010, uh, the process relative humidity data were removed from the PDS uh, because there were uncertainties at the lowest temperatures because uh, those values were not covered. Uh, a revised calibration function uh, was uh, proposed by Aaron, uh, by Zent, in a, a couple of years ago. And then more recently, uh, we have conducted a new recalibration using an engineering unit that we borrowed from, from JPL. And we subjected this uh, engineering unit to the full range of environmental conditions that were found at the Phoenix landing site. Um, and uh, I'm going to show results of these relative humidity values, which I think that they are very important because, again, we only have in situ data at two points of the planet. And, and this is the North Pole, which is richer uh, in terms of humidity than Gale Crater. So I think it's, it's important. So these are the results of our recalibration. Uh, here I'm showing the whole set of recalibrated uh, relative humidity data as a function of the local true solar time. Um, uh, as you remember, uh, the Phoenix mission operated for 150 sols, pretty much from uh, day one, or sol one had a solar longitude of 77, and then sol 151 was the latest, and Elsa Bess one was 148. So the TCP was operating uh, during the whole mission, but not continuously, uh, as you can see. And that was because of like energetic uh, demands. Um, so what you can see here, hopefully, or uh, hopefully you can see that, is that um, in our recalibration, we achieved saturated conditions only uh, between sols 90 and 100, corresponding to an ELSA base of 125. And this is good because uh, that was the time when two independent measurements, uh, the LiDAR and the robotic arm, detected, uh, detected near surface fog. So our values are, are in agreement with independent estimations. Now you might be wondering, how does your recalibration compare to previous recalibration? That's what I'm showing here. Here I'm showing the water vapor pressure uh, from, the, from the relative humidity sensor. As a function or as a function of local true solar time, and I'm using in 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 yellow. I'm using the values of our um, recent recalibration. In uh, orange, I'm showing the values from the 2016 recalibration, and in blue, I'm showing the values from the original uh, calibration. Uh, once again, the values in blue were removed from the PDS. The values in orange were added to the PDS in 2017. But, uh, and both the orange and the, and the blue values used the original pre-flight calibration. So our um, uh, yellow values here, again, uh, come from the recalibration in, in our chamber. And what you can see is that while during nighttime our values are in excellent agreement with those from, from Aaron in, in 2016, during the daytime our values show one order of magnitude, uh, are one order of magnitude higher. So that's, that's a big difference. Um, we think that this is because uh, the orange values and the blue values were not calibrated at typical conditions at daytime. They were not calibrated at the exact pair of relative humidity and temperatures that were achieved in, in the Phoenix. Uh, we also compared our values with independent measurements from, from orbiters and from the, and from the uh, SSI. And our values are in better agreement, uh, values, uh, I mean, as high as, as 1.4 Pascal. So we are confident that these values are, are, um, are going to be useful for the community. Um, by the way, uh, these are results uh, of a paper that we submitted to JGR, and that's uh, under review. Um, as soon as, at the same time, um, I contacted the PDS guys and I plan to upload all the data to the PDS so that the community has access to the whole set of data. And I hope to do that within the next weeks. Uh, that has to be fast. Okay, so now that we know the actual environmental conditions from the Phoenix and from the MSL, let's theoretically analyze brain formation on Mars. So what I'm showing here again is a stability diagram of sodium, uh, a stability diagram in terms of temperature and relative humidity 
for uh, sodium, per uh, sodium, magnesium, and calcium perchlorate. And then I'm superimposing in situ values at different heights from the MSL mission and from the Phoenix mission, okay? Um, so, so basically at different heights, I just did that by using temperature at different heights. And uh, what we can see here, uh, oh, also, uh, sorry, for reference, uh, I'm showing here two isobars, which are these dashed uh, gray lines. This is for uh, the isobar of 1.4 Pascal, which is the highest water vapor pressure value measured, both at the Phoenix and at the MSL. So this is the highest in situ measurement of water vapor pressure, and this is the lowest, uh, point, uh, or 5 to the minus 3. So, okay, what we can see is that if we pay attention to the MSL colors, yellow and purple, we do not really cross, uh, you know, like the, the, uh, the area where the liquescence would be favored. Uh, but this is in the air and in the ground. Uh, recently, uh, Edgar Rivera Valentin published a paper last year uh, analyzing the potential for the liquescence to happen in the subsurface. And there it was more, um, there was a higher potential. So MSL, the surface is very unlikely that brines form over there at Gale Crater. What about at the Phoenix landing site? So here we are showing uh, in the air, we have some cross. There are like a few salts in which for 10 minutes the conditions were favorable for brine formation. Those are here. And then results from modeling, and that is shown in pink, show that, yeah, like brain formation uh, could indeed happen at the ground at the Phoenix landing site and definitely in the subsurface. So this is basically telling us that the Phoenix is wetter than, than MSL, which we already know. So, um, yeah, like ground at the Phoenix, yeah, maybe the liquescence at the, at the MSL, no, uh, based on this. Um, so, okay. Uh, another set of conclusions here. So once again, the liquescence is theoretically viable. It's, it's, it's possible, we, we reach those conditions, but another uh, important topic is kinetics. So basically like uh, whether the liquescence is rapid enough to occur during those times, because we are talking about very low temperatures. And another interesting thing that came up was that results from our recalibration uh, show that the water vapor uh, pressure uh, varies by two order of magnitude during a diurnal cycle. So we have a super strong variation right at the surface. Um, and this is definitely suggesting that the uh, regolith plays a significant role in, in this exchange. So let me get back to the, to the regolith and, 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 and here I'm... Uh, I'm um, so basically the, uh, I'm going to talk about the potential exchange of H2O between the regolith and, and the atmosphere. As you know, the regolith of Mars consists of a loosely packed porous material which allows for the exchange of H2O between the regolith and the atmosphere. We know that this exchange can occur via physisorption, salt hydration, brine formation, and, and frost formation. We all know what brine formation is and frost formation. Uh, also salt hydration, just in case physisorption is when, when water molecules get physically attached to the surface of uh, soil grains and, and minerals, and, and obviously salt hydration is like changes in the hydration state. So, okay, we have these four mechanisms to exchange water between the surface and the atmosphere. Getting back to, to the same figure, so to the stability diagram, what we have learned from MSL and Phoenix measurements, and I think that this is very relevant, is that uh, only, or not only, sorry, that when, when the temperature is above 220, so let's, let's do this horizontal line here, the relative humidity is very low. It's already like around 10%. And it's only when the temperature ranges between 180 and, and 220 that we have the whole range of relative humidity conditions, that we have like between 10 and 100. And this is important because most of the experiments previously performed uh, showed that for temperatures above 220, yeah, like all these processes could work. You know, like they, they would take place within minutes or within seconds. But once again, above 220 Kelvin, relative humidity is, is very low. So I think that it's very, very important to um, uh, basically like expand these experimental results and, and, and do them, but at temperatures between 180 and 220, because again, that's where we have the, the variation in, in relative humidity. So I, I think that that's, that's going to be important for the water cycle on Mars. Uh, OK, so I'm closing Mars now. Uh,
uh, that, that's fine. Um, so once we analyzed, and, and we have to keep analyzing brand formation on Mars, we took the next logical step and we developed this uh, sensor to search for brands on Mars and beyond. This is uh, results. Uh, this uh, uh, suite of sensors is shown in a paper that Nilton recently that we published. Uh, Nilton Reno is the, the first author on astrobiology, so you can find the details uh, there. And this is basically the uh, modern aqueous habitat, uh, habitat recognition suite, and it's basically aimed at characterizing the habitability and, and weathering on Mars and beyond. It is composed of these four sensors, all of which have TRL6. And um, um, very quickly here, uh, this environmental suite responds to the, to the top priorities of the Decadal Survey and, and the science plan recommendation. Um, here we have the, the goals of, of, the, of the suite, which is search for wet brines in the shallow subsurface, mostly and characterization of the aeolian uh, processes, exchange of material, and uh, the effects of uh, regulate moisture on saltation. So it's basically about like how water and dust is exchanged between the surface and the and the atmosphere. Um, okay. Uh, once we uh, did what we could do on Mars, we decided that we had to move to or we have to move to the icy walls. So with the background that we have on Mars, our plan is to again like move to the to the to the icy walls and study brine formation in 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 in, in these walls. So to give some context, we know that the availability of liquid H2O might be the best resolved aspect of uh, Europa's habitability, but uh, directly accessing the ocean is going to be very tricky. So we believe that that justifies the need for a better understanding of brine formation in the shallow subsurface of these uh, uh, worlds. We found extremely encouraging that the eutectic temperature of solutions of ammonia and water uh, were as low as 160 Kelvin. Also very encouraging that the eutectic temperature of lithium and, and, uh, and ammonia solution can be as low as 90 Kelvin. So with this in mind, what we uh, basically like how, how would brine form in the shallow subsurface of, of uh, Europa or, or icy walls like this? So what we propose or what we hypothesize is that freeze thaw cycles could, oh, that was the sound? So that's one or two? Two minutes, two minutes. okay. Uh, so what we hypothesize is that freeze thaw cycles could produce complex brines with the, low, uh, with the lowest uh, eutectic temperature possible for the chemicals available. So what we plan is to use uh, advantage or knowledge of the elemental abundance in, in carbonaceous chondrites, uh, such as the existence of lithium and, 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 and ammonia. So we're going to pretty much like take, take advantage of all that we know about the composition of the shallow subsurface, again, from, from uh, carbonaceous chondrites and, and, and orbital measurements. And then we're going to go to our environmental chamber again, and we plan to experimentally determine the lowest uh, detected temperature um, uh, for aqueous solutions that could exist uh, in the icy walls. And we plan to determine the Raman of, of such components. So this is our next step, basically, like move from Mars to the icy walls with what we know. And defi definitely, we'll have to go to lower temperatures. And that's why we hypothesize these cycles and this reduction in eutectic temperature. That is pretty much the end of my talk. But since this is an astrobiology conference, I just wanted to let you know uh, that uh, I'm guessing that you all are interested in UV data. As you know, UV measurements are being measured for the first time at the surface of Mars by the MSL from the, from the REMS instrument. And the UV measurements are, UV is being measured like in six different channels. And very quickly, what I want to say is that uh, the current values in the PDS are subjected to uncertainties due to dust deposition on the UV sensor. So due to the location of the sensor on the deck of the rover, which is facing upwards, dust has been deposited on the sensor. So what happened, uh, this is just like a picture at the beginning of the mission and, and later. So what happened is that uh, the UV measurements uh, as a function of LMST for two sols separated by exactly one year and with the same opacity are very different. They should be the same because it's one year, same opacity, but here it's much lower because of the dust deposition. So we have uh, corrected the values from dust deposition by calculating a dust correction factor 
you might not be interested in the details of this because this is radiative transfer and, and, and some other things. But the thing is that now we have produced, we have generated a new data set of UV measurements at Gale Crater that are free from the effects of dust deposition. This is an example of the performance. This is what we have in the PDS. This is what we are producing now. And the higher value is because we have removed that effect. And these corrected values have been used for uh, methane studies, you know, like uh, these corrected values were compared to the concentration of methane. Um, I'm not, I mean, like uh, Webster explained that much better than me, but what I'm saying is like these corrected UV values are very important for us, as astrobiologist people. So we'll be uploading the data shortly and uh, that will be accessible for the entire community. Uh, so this is just the summary, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. We have time for a quick question. <laughs> Hopefully it was understandable, my talk. <laughs> OK, so I'm going to make something up. Um, all right, so you were talking about the importance of kinetics, which we thus far haven't accounted for. And you did the experiment at 223 Kelvin, and you saw no deliquescence of calcium perchlorate for how long was it? Mm, two hours and a half, something like that. Oh. We, we, yeah. Yeah, okay. So then, next question would then be uh, Do you have plans to continue these type of kinetic experiments and increase that delta T to see? We have plans to continue the liquescence experiments and also like like uh, adsorption, desorption, and chemi we, we we have plans. Yeah, uh, obviously pending funding, <laughs> but but we have plans. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Vincent Chevrier, University of Arkansas. Um, in your experiments about uh, free thaw cycles, you said that you observed when you had the perchlorate layer on top of the ice, you saw melting within minutes. Uh, yes. That, okay, uh, what about refreezing? When you cross the, the other side, did you see yes. rapid freezing or was it slowed down? That's a great question. Not as fast, but we saw refreezing, but also within minutes. Okay. Yeah, so when we took the Gaussian decomposition, we saw, yeah, we, we detected that and it was also fast. By fast, I mean minutes. Okay. Okay, thank you.